Welcome to Professionalism and Customer Service in the Healthcare Environment, Key Elements of Effective Communication. This is Lecture A, Verbal Communication. The objectives for this lecture, Verbal Communication, are to define communication, identify assumptions about communication, identify general and health-specific communication models, and identify communication variables. Since the 1940s, there have been many definitions of communication. Common to most of these definitions are four components. The first component is the sender. The second component is the receiver of the information. The third component is the actual transfer or sharing of the information. In addition, in order for the transfer of information to occur, there must be a common set of rules to enable understanding. Thus, the fourth component is a common set of rules. A simple example of common rules is a common language. Think about the difficulty in sharing information verbally with a person who doesn't speak the same language you do. When we combine the four components, a simple definition for communication is as follows. Communication is the process of sharing information between a sender and a receiver using a common set of rules. Now we'll discuss several assumptions or expectations used in communication. For some, the word communication reflects a linear one-way transfer of information. Ideally, with effective communication, the sender delivers a message to a receiver, and the receiver understands the intended meaning of the sender. However, communication is not that simple. Communication is ongoing, changing, and dynamic in nature. Many factors can impede effective communication. Examples include physical and emotional states, background knowledge, and abilities of both the sender and the receiver. For example, imagine that your five-year-old son hasn't cleaned his room even though you've told him to do so three times. You might be frustrated and ready to remove certain privileges, such as time watching his favorite TV program. You start to talk to him about the need for him to clean his room. However, when you discover that he's not feeling well and has a fever, the entire conversation changes into something different. Now you're likely to shift your conversation to concern over his well-being. The transactional nature of communication suggests a reciprocal relationship where there's a continual feedback loop. In this way, the sender influences the receiver. In turn, the sender is influenced by the receiver. Stated more simply, communication can be thought of as a two-way street. The transactional nature of communication is considered by some people to be an extension of the process itself. Here's an illustration of communication in a health IT setting. The exchange starts with a sender, a message, run the CMS measures report, and a receiver. The receiver's feedback, do you know when the latest data will be available, and the sender's subsequent response illustrate the feedback loop. The expectation is that each participant comes away with the same understanding from the exchange. The last basic assumption of human communication is that communication is multidimensional. Some suggest there are two dimensions, or levels, to communication. The first level relates to the content of the message, and the second level is the relationship or context dimension. During a conversation, these two dimensions are active and can influence one another. For example, your supervisor asks you, why didn't you finish the coding assignment this week? Under one scenario, it could be a playful jest when he knows that you spent the week supporting users during an intense implementation. Under another, it could be that you're at a meeting where all the other programmers completed their projects on time and your delay is going to impact the project. Or it may be a combination of both meanings, concern that there will be a delay, but said in a joking way to convey that the supervisor understands the reason for the delay. Nordhaus and Nordhaus discuss a variety of communication models. One of the oldest communication models is known as the Shannon and Weaver model. Developed in 1949, the model contains five components which are focused around the message itself. They are 1. Information source, 2. Transmitter, 3. Sources of noise, 4. Receiver, and five, destination. The information source is the actual message content of the conversation. The transmitter refers to the person who will be sending the message. Sources of noise refer to anything that creates difficulty in receiving the message. For example, if a psychiatric patient in the emergency department is yelling at everyone who passes asking for a cigarette, that patient is a source of noise, a distraction. If someone were trying to talk to you while this is going on, the patient's noise might make it difficult for you to get the message the speaker is trying to convey. Using the same example, if the patient is the information source, the sender trying to communicate, 
The inappropriateness of his behavior becomes the source of noise. In this case, a different kind of noise, but one that nonetheless makes his message difficult to receive. The receiver is the person intended to get the message. Finally, the destination refers to the message having been received. That is, it reached its destination and was understood. The second model is the Burlow communication model, which is also known as the SMCR model, or Source Message Channel Receiver Model. The first component, the source, refers to the sender of the information. Attributes of the source include the communication skills of the sender and his or her attitudes, knowledge, social system, and culture. In short, the message is affected by the attributes or characteristics of the source. For example, a health IT analyst's knowledge enables her to use technical terms that makes her message clear to her colleagues. Her communication skills come into play when she must make this same information clear to clinical personnel or others who might not understand the technical jargon. The next component of the SMCR model, the message, has its own unique characteristics, such as structure and content code. The structure of a message refers to how a message is arranged. The code is the form in which the message is sent, such as by using language or gestures. The third component, channel, deals with how or by what avenue the message is sent or received, such as seeing, touching, smelling, and or tasting. For example, you may find that some people communicate differently in emails than in face-to-face -face meetings. A clinician, for instance, might complain bitterly in an email about a system, yet be calm and reasonable in a face-to-face -face meeting to discuss the same problem. In these cases, it's important to determine which channels work best with your customers and do your best to encourage use of those channels. The final component of the SMCR model is the receiver. It's important to understand that just as a message is affected by the sender's attributes, the message that is received is dependent on the receiver's communication skills, attitudes, knowledge, social system, and culture. The Burlow, or SMCR model, is a very popular model. Both the Shannon Weaver and Burlow models represent general communication models. The two models displayed on this slide pertain specifically to clinician-client communications found in the healthcare environment. Although you might not be in a clinical role, having a basic understanding of communication in a clinical context can give you a better sense of the culture of healthcare. The therapeutic model addresses the important role of relationships in assisting clients and patients with an overall goal of moving away from illness and toward health. This communication often occurs between clinician and patient. It serves to increase the clinician's understanding of the patient's perspective of the illness and helps the patient cope. The King Interaction model is related to the communication process between nurses and patients. This model incorporates dimensions of relationship, process, and transaction identified as crucial elements in the successful communication process. On the previous slide, we saw two health-related communication models. Each model addresses communication between clinician and client. Does this mean that communication in a healthcare setting needs to follow one of these two models? The answer is no. In carrying out duties associated with being a health IT professional, your communication will likely take place in all different areas and levels in the organization. Depending on the group you're working with, you'll need to adapt your style to suit the situation. As a health IT professional, your projects represent change to the organization, and you'll be responsible for communicating with customers about the change. Change is typically met with resistance. Your ability to communicate with and adapt to people with different attitudes and skill levels will be critical to successful implementation of change. You'll likely experience times when the information you're communicating won't be well received by the customers. You could be explaining that the information system doesn't yet possess or doesn't have the budget to fund development of certain features or functions. For example, biometric security devices or voice recognition. In these circumstances, when you tell clinicians about limitations, you should also explain why the features can't be included and what plans, if any, there may be for adding them in the future. As we've seen, communication in the healthcare setting includes four different types of interactions. Professional with professional, professional with client, professional with the family or significant other, and client with family or significant other. For example, a physician may discuss treatment options with a patient's spouse if the patient has Alzheimer's disease. Considered in the context of the health IT professional, there will be communication between other professionals, clients, including patients, and the public. Although there is no one specific health IT communication model, 
The Berlow SMCR model is appropriate in this context because it addresses all of the elements involved in the transactional and complex process of communication. We previously looked at communication models and action variables that play a part in the communication models. Our focus now shifts to additional variables, identified by Nordhaus and Nordhaus, that are often a part of health communication and that support the transactional and at times emotional nature of communication. We discuss each of these variables in detail in the following slides. Empathy is one of the more complex variables in communication. The term empathy is thought to have its origins in the early 1900s as feeling into by German psychologist Theodor Lips. There are many different definitions, such as relating to others' feelings, acknowledging the state of another person, and sharing one's feelings. A common single-word definition for empathy is understand. The phrase, I see where you're coming from, reflects the understanding perspective. When health IT professionals empathize with others in the healthcare setting, they improve the accuracy of their communication. Suppose the nurses in an emergency department are having difficulty learning to navigate a new interface and become frustrated. The health IT support person can use an empathetic approach by saying, in a non-patronizing tone, I see that your job is complex. Which tasks do you do most often? We'll start with those. This statement lets the nurses know that their difficulty is understandable and redirects the discussion to focus first on their high-priority needs. After they master the most important tasks, the nurses will feel more confident and less frustrated as the health IT professional guides them through the others. The use of empathy also helps health IT professionals develop effective, strong interpersonal relationships, which are essential to establishing productive rapport with clinicians. Building trust and good rapport will help ameliorate the multitude of stressful situations that could otherwise result in antagonistic relationships. It's important to note that empathy is not sympathy or pity for an individual or coworker. Again, think of the word understand. In communication, control is also an important factor. There are two components of control. The first one, personal control, refers to the perception that a person can influence the way he or she responds internally to external events. Thus, personal control reflects how strongly one feels about one's own actions and minimizes the thought of powerlessness. For example, enabling a physician to choose between several options to address a workflow issue gives that physician ownership and a sense of control of the solution and greatly increases the probability of successful implementation. The second component of control is relational control. Relational control focuses on relationships or interpersonal characteristics. Stated more simply, in the communication process, relational control addresses the interactions that occur between individuals during communication. It's always important to share control in conversations as much as possible. For example, conversations that are heavily dominated by one party can serve to devalue the other party, who may think, my input or ideas are not needed or valued. Sharing control allows both parties to feel that they are being heard and respected. In health IT, it's important to know that you'll be working with highly intelligent professionals and that they won't react as well to mandates as they will to collaboration. Even if the implementation is a corporate mandate, some aspects of it will involve collaboration, and you should seize on those opportunities to show the users you are trying to incorporate their desires into the solution. Always strive to give the users some ownership in the solution being implemented. The third action variable identified by Nordhaus and Nordhaus Trust is central in human communication. Trust refers to having confidence in others. In the professional setting, having trust creates a supportive climate, thereby reducing defensive or negative communication. From a health IT professional's perspective, developing and or further improving trust includes projecting to the user's competence with the technical components, without getting too technical about it, and collaborating with them on the non-technical process components that are crucial to effective implementation. In short, because clinicians and administrators are typically extremely busy, if you, as the designated IT resource, are untrustworthy, they'll seek to avoid you, they may sabotage your initiatives, or they'll demand another resource for assistance. It's also important to remember that for some people, trust must be earned. Your actions over a period of time will allow a trusting relationship to develop. Be prepared to put in the time to earn the user's trust. The fourth variable is self-disclosure. Self-disclosure is defined as a process in which an individual communicates personal information, 
thoughts, or feelings to others. While self-disclosure is frequently seen in a patient-physician relationship so the physician can effectively manage the patient's care, it's not frequently seen in professional-to-professional communication. Of note, in any care delivery setting, one must always safeguard what is said, observed, or heard regarding any patient information. Patient information constitutes protected health information, PHI, and should be shared only with those who have a need to know in accordance with organizational policies and privacy regulations. Inappropriate sharing of a patient's information can lead to employment termination and can also carry heavy fines for the offending party. In another lecture, we'll revisit this topic and the importance of understanding the organization's policies for protecting PHI. This is a shared responsibility among everyone within the organization. Our last variable is confirmation. Confirmation is a way of sharing acknowledgement and acceptance to others. While confirmation can include aspects of the four previously defined variables, it's also a variable itself. There are both verbal and nonverbal aspects of confirmation. An example of verbal confirmation is repeating what the other person said, such as, I heard you say you want to pursue use of templates for procedure documentation, or so my understanding is that you don't like the user interface in that radiology work list system. Confirming what has been said can reduce ambiguity and result in a more effective course of action. A nonverbal aspect of confirmation is to physically nod your head in agreement to what is being said by a client. In your health IT professional role, documenting important decisions that are made and by whom is important. People often forget or have differing recollections of the details. When someone asks when a particular decision was made, you should be able to refer to some sort of written documentation of the decision, the form, and the participants. It's helpful to recap the decisions and tasks to be done at the end of any meeting or conversation, along with a written follow-up to create a clear record. This concludes Lecture A, Key Elements of Effective Communication, Verbal Communication. In summary, communication is a dynamic reciprocal process that can be impacted by numerous factors, such as emotional and physical state and attitudes. According to the Nordhaus and Nordhaus model we discussed, the presence of certain important elements can facilitate effective communication. Empathizing with the person you're communicating with can help establish a good rapport. Sharing control by adopting a collaborative approach can make the other party feel valued and less powerless. Establishing trust through professional behavior that enhances your credibility can create a supportive environment. Finally, providing confirmation of the other party through actions such as nodding your head in agreement or repeating back to someone your understanding of their situation communicates acknowledgement and acceptance. In summary, we reviewed the common elements of communication and presented a definition. We explored the three common assumptions of communication, including the process nature of communication, the transactional nature of communication, and the multidimensional nature of communication. We identified two popular communication models and two health-related communication models. The health-related communication models were presented to share examples of clinician-client communication interactions. Finally, we identified five common communication variables in the healthcare setting.